Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by Jags, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jags.com for everything you need for your vehicle. Well, I'm, I think I'm going to steal Rolling Stones. Please allow me to introduce my friend. He's a man of wealth and fame. <laughs> Dale! <laughs> Dale Earnhardt Jr. Jr., how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, Kenny. It's good to see you. Um, not as good as being there in person uh, to hang out, but don't get to talk to you as much as I'd like to, so I've been looking forward to this. Well, we definitely have a long-distance relationship, and uh, I guess our friendship started years ago, but I specifically remember being your friend uh, at Dave Mater's slot car track in what was that mooresville yeah that so, was yeah we had dave mater the third raced in the cup series and um but he also was a very um successful short track racer and when his cup career kind of ended he took over this little store on main street in mooresville and put a slot car track in there and man it, you were always there boy i was always there and, you know, you'd see a lot of other people in the industry. Dave was always really good. Um, and, you know, you, I still have. So you bought those wooden boxes, right, that you, you kept your slot cars in. I still have mine. I got mine, too. My tires are dry rotted. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the simpler time, man, we were, I don't even remember. I must have been in my, you know, 18, 19 years old. And uh, you were you were right in the middle of your career, and um, yeah, it was fun to go over there and and try to figure out how to be competitive and messing with those cars and trying to buy the coolest and latest and greatest. And uh, and then you know, then Dave moved out one day. The slot car track went away, and and we got into RC cars, you know, bigger stuff. Tent scale, quarter scale stuff kept on getting bigger, and bigger. But I still got that wooden box with all of my cars in it, just like I walked out of that building the last time I was in it. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna I'm gonna go up. It's in my my uh, garage. I'm gonna take a picture of it, and I'm gonna post it later this <laughs> week. Uh, you know, it always it always come down to uh, trying to be better. And you know, when we would win like heats or a mains, he he would pay like eight dollars. <laughs> and he'd give you credit and you could take that eight dollars and go buy tires and track rental time yeah stuff yeah. like that well you know as old larry mac reynolds say junior i'm loaded up on my notes we're gonna have a good time so um i always remind everybody kenny conversation is just that we, we go every which way uh everything doesn't have to be in order so i've had this up in my race shop for a long time and I'm going to show it to you. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about this. So this is a piston. Okay. You got a good idea what this is? Yeah. Come out of your race car, your qualifying engine. Uh, you wanted to pull the Rockingham. So I want to go a little bit deeper into it. So I'm going to turn this over. So if you look at it, it looks like they were made. It says DEI and then there's, you know, looks like the number two cylinder. Yep. So I drove that Penzo car for DEI. You and I were teammates. We set quick time and uh, run second in the race. But it wasn't until weeks later, I go to DEI, and I believe it was Richie. At that time, he was the motor man, and he gave that to me. But the reason I want to bring you in, into this is he's, he said, Dale Earnhardt Jr., started this uh do you know the story behind those pistons because that piston came out of that motor right when we had qualifying motors yeah so the um obviously when we could change engines we would run a practice motor then you put in a qualifying engine and then you'd put in a race motor and run a few laps on on that motor in the final practice there was a huge difference from behind the steering wheel, you could feel how much faster that qualifying motor was. And it was built 
to really only do one thing, and that was go fast for a couple laps. And it would not you know under any circumstance, at least in, in my rookie year in 2002, 2003, it, under any circumstance would that motor ever be put in for the race. It just wasn't going to make it. It wasn't built for that. You run lightweight oils and all those things, and all the coatings and everything was purposely made just to be able to make it a couple laps. And <clears throat> And so you knew that that motor would come back and, and more often than not, a lot of the parts in that motor might not get used again. They would end up taking the pistons out and different things like that. So when the motors, you know, got the pole, we started taking those pistons and um, I've got a handful of them myself um, still at my house, but I don't remember I don't remember bringing that idea to Richie. I appreciate him giving me the credit for it <clears throat> because it's a pretty cool idea. But, um, you know, it's neat to have, you know, that the piston knowing what it was doing inside that engine during that short period of time. It's kind of, you know, comparable to having something off of a rocket or, uh, yeah. you know, knowing where that rocket went and all it had to do to lift off the ground and and go through the air <clears throat> you know it's a it's an impressive piece of machinery and then to know that you were behind the wheel and um and you succeeded on being the fastest pole you know when i <clears throat> when i look back on my career and even today when i race in the xfinity series i was never more nervous behind the wheel of a car than right before qualifying oh me too hundred percent. You know, he's terrified because brutal. The funny thing about it is, is like people just people are like, "How are you not more nervous for the race?" The race is a is a long uh, process, and you are in control of your pace, and you get to pick and choose when you're going to push, when you're going to take it easy, when you're going to take care of the car, how hard you need to run at certain points in the race, and it's. It's um, you're never, you know, you don't run a race at 110% every second, every foot of the track. In qualifying, you do. In qualifying, your job is to go out there and overachieve. And the other thing, too, was everybody was watching. The whole field is lined up on pit road watching every car run, every crew chief, every car owner. Everybody's paying attention. So when you get it right, that's great. When you screw it up. That's not so great because everybody saw it. And when you were so-so or average or forgettable and you were forgettable or average for multiple weeks in a row, you know, it would, <laughs> it hurts your ego. You know, yeah. you felt like it was an indictment on your reputation as a driver. And I remember having some of my most emotional, challenging times as a driver when I was having this sort of stretch of qualifying in the, you know, low twenties. I, I remember <clears throat> one of the last couple of years I raced full time. I felt like I qualified 23rd every week and it broke me. Like I, I, I was, <clears throat> I had had all I could stand of qualifying 23rd and <clears throat> you know, the racing, the racing was hard emotionally. It was, you know, difficult to finish below your, <clears throat> your expectations, but you always were going to come back and try again the next week. And even now, like when I was, I was saying, when I get in that car to qualify the Xfinity car, I had to go to Homestead just a couple of weeks ago. And I think I went out first and <clears throat> I don't have a guaranteed spot in the field. And uh, don't, I'm not, I'm not getting to watch where other people are racing on the track or going to, you know, you, you can watch other people qualify and go, okay, he, he run a good line. I'm going to run that line. I didn't have any of that. And so qualifying happens five minutes after the end of practice. Mm -hmm. When my practice session ended, I got out of the car. Like we always do. The crew came over and said, you need to get back in. You're getting ready to go qualify in five minutes. And so I buckle in and I'm still putting my gloves on and the guy's telling me to crank the motor to pull off. And I'm like, this is crazy. And uh, I ain't got my head on straight. You know, I don't know what I'm about to do. I ain't even thought, I ain't had a chance to think about what I'm going to do. And uh, I call, I mean, I was so nervous the week leading up to 
the Xfinity races at Bristol and at Homestead. Because at Bristol, I think I had to go out third. Maybe it was first. But <clears throat> anyways, I called Timmy Hill. I didn't call the champion or the last week's race winner. I called Timmy Hill because Timmy's had a lot of experience going out first, going out third, going out second. He knew how that track was going to be. He knew the pressure, and he knew, you know, I needed to know what his thoughts were on what I should be expecting and what to safeguard against. And so um, <clears throat> it's intimidating, man, even after all these years. I really <clears throat> appreciate you sharing that with me because I'm going to go somewhere with that. You know, I really listen to what you you have to say. I think once I start talking about it, you're going to remember. So <laughs> Being your friend, Sonoma, you're on the you're you're leaning on the back of your Budweiser car at that time at, at the road course, and you didn't qualify real good. And I walked up to you and I said, uh, in you know our friendship, well, I said, "What's wrong, man?" And you were you were heartbroken. And here today, you're admitting that qualifying will, will break a person because it was such a show back then. All eyes. Mm -hmm. Do you remember saying that to me at Sonoma? You said, I feel like I, I've let everybody down. Is what, what you said to me. No, I don't remember it, but I, I, um, that's how it felt. You know, um, I, I remember I'll share this. I've never shared this one with anybody, but I, I'll give you this one. Um, thank you. It was, uh, me and Amy were, uh, me and Amy were not married yet. Uh, we might have been, I can't remember. This was like 2015, 16 or 17. It was one of those years, last couple of years in my career. We're at Richmond and I, I feel like I've qualified 23rd for eight weeks in a row. I mean, it just, it, it wasn't, I really didn't qualify 23rd, eight weeks in a row, but gosh, it felt like I just, I had this sort of writer's block. I just could not get past that, that, you know, that sort of mediocre, even less than mediocre performance in qualifying. And it was bugging the hell out of me. And I, I didn't know why we couldn't do better. And <clears throat> we were at Richmond and it was wearing on me. I'd take it home and think about it. And, and um, you know, probably the race performances probably weren't a whole lot better, um, to be honest with you. But uh, I qualified 22nd or 23rd and went back to the bus and uh, walked into the bus and walked back into the bathroom and shut the door and cried. And I, I mean, mm. I didn't know what else, I didn't know what else to do. Mm. And Amy come back here and she don't know, you know, why am I upset about this? It's qualifying. And I'm like, you know, you're doing this all your life. You know, in your heart, you believe you're good at it. You want to believe you're one of the best at it. And no matter what you're doing or no matter how you try to approach it, you keep getting the same result, you know, and, you know, I never, I never really cried over results. Like I'm physically cried over results in my life, but that'll tell you right there that one day at Richmond, that qualifying effort was all I could take. It'd been building and building weeks in week week in and week out. <clears throat> I don't know why. I mean, I've I've had some race results that hurt, you know, hurt your heart. Right. But never never did I get out of the car and cry or go home and cry over it, you know. But uh for whatever reason that day I was just at my wits end and um and and the only only qualifying could do that to you. I don't know why qualifying mattered that much, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it, let me um, – I almost want to call an audible, uh, and I'm going to. I'm going to go to the very end of my notes. Uh, you and I share something in common. Now, you've had way more success than me, and, I, and we're going to rattle off your stats later on because I like to remind people. But you and I share something in common. Your dad was the man. My brother was the man. Uh, Rusty could never understand why I was not him. And I would read, you know, years past, 20 years ago, why people are like, 
Dale Jr. is not his dad. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I never wanted to be my brother. I just wanted to do what Rusty did. I wanted to do what my dad did. So you telling me that story, and we've all been there. You're no different than anybody. But do you do you feel like, you know, coming to your wits end of qualifying that is just because of who you are? Or do you think it was just because you had enough? I just wanted to do good. Uh, I was um, – I – always felt like that I was falling short of expectations. Mm -hmm. um, even if no one ever said anything to me, my expectation was my father, his success, right? It wasn't that people were coming up to me and saying, man, you're not winning enough. You're not doing this enough. I mean, I heard the talk out there. He's never going to be his daddy. He's riding his coattails, all of those things. But None of that really that bothered me that bad, to be honest with you. All of the talk, all the noise outside uh, that might be negative never, never really bothered me. <clears throat> I expected to be a champion. I expected to be a winner. I wanted badly, badly to, to win. And so when, you know, when I'd go out there, and I watch, you know, I look, I'd go out, run laps in practice, look at the sheet. <clears throat> All right, that's not good enough. Or, okay, we're fast today. Um, go and qualify. That was great. Nope, not good enough. Got, I'm disappointed in that. And, and that, you know, that bothered me badly. Uh, uh, we go to race in the race on Sunday or Saturday. <clears throat> You walk away with the result you expect, maybe a little better. Maybe you're surprised by the result or you're super disappointed in it. And I just lived it every single day. And when I finished poorly, mm. I would not feel okay about that until I could get back in the car and fix it. Mm. And so if I ran bad on Sunday, I was a miserable person until the next Sunday. And you know, it just, I, uh, you know, I, 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 people might think that I felt a lot of pressure from the outside about, you know, my last name and my dad and his fans or my fans and just the, in the, the NAS, you know, the NASCAR fandom in general, just having these certain, you know, high expectations of me. I had even higher expectations of myself. You know, and later in my career, I felt like, you know, I, you know, I, I had gotten with Steve Letarte. We had sort of developed this process of improving, um, which I can go into detail about. But when my career was over in 2011, 12, right? Mm -hmm. I was sitting there thinking, man, I don't know how in the hell this is ever going to get turned around. I don't know who could turn it around. I don't know if it's possible. I'm no longer in the, you know, under the wing of my father's company. I'm out outside of that security and that safety net. I'm at HMS. There's nowhere to hide. If you can't run good in that car, there's no excuse. And so I was sitting there around 2011 and 12 thinking that, my, you know, I might wake up one day and, and, and my career could be over whether I want it to end or not. Um, Rick, to his credit, assured me, we're going to keep working. We're going to keep trying. We're going to keep trying. I never felt from Rick Hendrick or anybody at Hendrick Motorsports that I was on thin ice, but damn, I, I knew the results. I knew the success that my teammates might be having. Anyways, I get put with Steve Letarte. Steve said, man, you're, you know, finishing 20th in points or worse. You're running like that every week. We're going to set a goal of 15th. And I was like, okay. I was like, you know, we'll just he just expected 15th. He didn't expect us to go run third. We started running 15th. 
when that started happening every single week, he said, all right, we're moving it to 10th, buddy. It's time to start finishing 10th or better. Mm-hmm. We started doing, you know, we, it took a little time, but we got to where we were a top 10 car every week. And then he said, Hey, guess what? I want you to go to the track and we're going to expect to run fifth. And I was like, okay. And then we would go to the racetrack and we would run in the top five every week. We had top five speed and we'd run there. We were battling with, Greg Biffle leading the points um, throughout the, you know, into the summer stretch, um, having a great couple of years. But Steve, like, put this progress in place that made sense. And it actually, you know, if you would, if you're standing at the bottom of that hill in 2013 and he said, hey, look up that hill. One day we're going to be running third. You'd go, damn, that, how's that possible? That's going to be hard to do. Well, over time, it, it, we got there, we achieved it. And then we were winning races, Daytona 500. And, um, he, uh, he walked in or, uh, I, I forget how I heard this, but I was at Charlotte motor speedway in 2014. And, uh, somebody said, Hey man, um, I got word that the tarp might be going to work for NBC next year. Mm. And when I heard, so when I heard that NBC was thinking about coming into NASCAR and becoming a partner, I called, uh, one of the, I called somebody that was sort of helping put all that together. And I said, you know who they need to put in the booth at NBC is Dale Jarrett. Dale Jarrett hadn't been in a booth, um, full time in quite a while. I think he'd been there before with ESPN and a few other people, but couldn't really remember. But I was like, man, you know, I was, I was opinionated about what our broadcast booths needed. And I was like, here's a shop for me to put in my two cents. I think the booth needs Dale Jarrett. Yeah. And they went and they went and hired my crew chief <laughs> that I was running good with. Yeah. And, uh, anyways, um, that might've been around 2013, but it broke my heart. And, um, you know, and so then I go into those final few years with Greg Ives and, and me and Greg became great friends. Um, I had some problems physically with concussions and things like that, that were definitely derailing our momentum and our ability to, you know, build as a team. And, um, and the results, were hard to come by for me in, in that final year. Um, and so even then though, man, I'd go to the racetrack thinking, um, I'm good enough and I'm with a good enough organization to run top five. And when that didn't happen, you know, you just would be just as disappointed as if it were 10 years ago. I didn't, I didn't go into that last year thinking, man, I'm just going to have good time. And this is going to be my swan song and right off into the sunset. You know, I wanted to win a race. I wanted to win races. I wanted to run great. And um, I still felt like I could. But those final few years, it was it was hard to reconcile with the reality. The, the results just didn't come as easy as you wanted. Them. Okay, th- this is excruciating for me because I love you as a friend. And we've gone down this road before. Uh, I think you're awesome. I think you're entirely... You're highly intelligent. Uh, let, let me just, let me just, uh, wow, that's very heavy for me. I, I want to read you your stats and we're, we're going to go back around. We're going to have some fun, but I want you to listen intently, okay? Yeah. Dale Earnhardt Jr., 49 years old right now, 776 NASCAR starts. You're in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. That is not to be taken lightly. That's unbelievable. You got 26 cup wins, 24 Xfinity wins. You are the 15-time NASCAR Cup most popular driver. And that's from 2003 to 2017. That's that's 15 years straight. You're the 1998-1999 Xfinity champion. You've won two. Daytona 500s, and as we always say, 
you're you're a two-time Daytona 500 champion, 2004, 2014. This one here blows my mind. Budweiser shootout winner, 03, 04, 08, 15, 16. And this one's even bigger. You won Talladega four straight years in a row. And, and Junior, there's way more. But I thought, okay, it, it would be ridiculous <laughs> to just keep going. So, buddy, you know, I think your story is what I call it's a cautionary tale where as great as we are, right away you went to the negative. So let, let's ease it up. I just read you your stats. Yeah. You're, you're great. You are great. And that's that's not – I'm not sure. What do you think when I tell you all that? Yeah, so that's why I watch I watch a lot of the races uh, from my past. I love watching old races no matter whether I was in them or not. But I do watch races that I was in. I watch a lot of the old Xfinity stuff from 98, 99. Yeah, you because- can't <laughs> Dude, well, we got to remember because we, we 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 forget. You're right. You know, you get down the road and you're like, yeah, you know, I I really only remember or, rem- you know, really on. I left with this, you know, imprint or emotional imprint from those final few years. The tough times destroys us. They do. I, I you know, I was with, uh, you know, I was around Jimmy Johnson a lot in, in his final few years and. You know, it blew my mind. I'd go to the racetrack with, and and here's a seven-time champion. Like he has done, he he won a championship seven <laughs> times over, right? right? Like God Almighty, how could you ever be disappointed with a run or a qualifying run or a race weekend when you got seven championships? You know, you're like that guy never gets sad about nothing. But dude, Jimmy Johnson, one one of the greatest drivers that ever was would get out of a car in the last couple of years of his career and be just as frustrated and, you know, looking for answers and distraught uh, over a run as anybody, you know, as, as this, as a 25 year old rookie still looking for his first win. And it blew my mind. I was like, damn, this guy is human. You know, he's a human being. He's got even all of that success hasn't weathered or leathered his emotions to where, dude, he still, he feels the hurt and the pain and the disappointment of, of, a, of a loss or, a, or just a frustrating run or just lack of speed. He feels that as real and as authentic as any other driver in the field. And so, you know, that, that was interesting to me. Um, but I, yeah, I do go back and look at the old bud days and, and, you know, kind of remind myself that, man, we had a good, we had some good stretches where, you know, we won a handful of Xfinity, uh, February races, the 300 in February, we won a, a handful of those in a row and, I could have kept going, you know, with yeah. the stats. <laughs> I know. I, I have to admit, you know, there, we were at Martinsville. Um, you love Martinsville. You always ran so good there. We were at Martinsville just a couple weeks ago, and somebody was like, you know, you had a you had a stretch of like five top five finishes in a row or something like that back in the Bud days. And yeah, I remember, um, I'll tell you this, we, we went – I went to Martinsville for my first race and ran into everything. I ran into the wall. I ran into the tow truck behind the wall. I ran into, <laughs> ran into everything, right? You hit everything except we the did. tow truck. Go out we there did. and hit it. We hit everything and the tow truck. I um, I had a rough day. So Tony Jr. and Tony Sr., we take our car up there to go test. And when we didn't run good, Tony Sr. and Tony Jr., they took you to work. And so we go up there to test. Tony Jr. and you, this is, this was neat to me back in the day, but more than likely most everybody had it. Tony Jr. took a piece of tungsten and shaped it like the, um, the perch, the spring perch on the trailing arm. And so the left rear trailing arm spring perch was made out of tungsten. 
And so it was like this unsprung weight that would plant the left rear tire on the ground at all times. Amazing. Yeah. And so we were, you know, we wait, we put tungsten in lower a frames for the left front, trying to figure out how to make this car work. And we ended up learning that putting that tungsten on the trailing arm somewhere back there at the rear axle was the way to go. We just had to disguise it to look like part of the car so that we didn't get in trouble because it was illegal. Good stuff. And man, we went there and ran in the top five, like six, seven races in a row. It was awesome. Um, and every time I went, when I went over to Hendrick, they're like, you know, they're great at Martinsville. They win a lot of races and we'd go there and I'm practicing in the top five. And I'm like, man, this thing's good. I just wonder if we can get a little better. Y'all ever put any tungsten in the <laughs> and they're looking at me like, what? Tungsten? Yeah. <laughs> We don't need that, you know. I don't know, but uh, well, down south, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mind doing a little cheating. I always wanted some advantage, yes, uh, over the competition, and uh, that was the easiest way to get it. So that leads me to this. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say back in the day. I, I think that's a little brutal. But we got this next gen car, uh, which is a whole nother conversation. But yep. In our day, Tony Jur- Tony Uri, Tony Sr., uh, they could craft a race car and make that car better than everybody else's. Do you think we're better off nowadays? Or I mean, I, I kind of liked it where a team could craft cars because when you look at Formula One, you know, it's Mercedes versus, uh, you know, all the other makers, you know, Porsche, Ferrari, whatever it is. What's your thought of, back then we could craft a car. I loved it. Um, I, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, there's pros and cons to both, right? There's, there's part of me. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, there's part of me that loves the creativity and I do miss, being able to create an advantage in the shop. Um, You know, I, but it, it's expensive. Hire, you know, you gotta, you got, you get a great fabricator that knows how to build a quarter panel better than anybody else. And he's going to get offers from other teams and you're going to be at battle all the time, trying to keep those people in your building and secrets don't last long. You know, you, you, the garage is so tight. Um, literally working on top of each other in some of these garages up down the, you know, the, the, in the series that, you know, people see everything. You're not going to hide nothing. Yeah. And so, um, I miss it. Uh, you know, I miss being able to sort of have an advantage in the shop over other companies, being able to hire better people, just, you know, flat out, yeah, you know, outspending them. But also, um, I love the peace of mind that the new next gen car brings where, man, if you, if you know how to set the thing up, you can, you can beat some of these guys, you know, and it's not, <clears throat> it's, it's not the parody that it brought was pretty evident in the first season now as we go through the next handful of years maybe you know those you know those high buck teams distance themselves from everybody else just like the old car but yeah i don't know i mean it costs a lot of money is what you're saying to outrun back in the day yeah. it does but it also sounds like it costs a lot of money this these days too <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> there's Denny no Hamlin says they're out there racing lamborghinis right uh, yeah you know so three hundred fifty thousand dollar race car um so i you know i think that you know in the xfinity series it's kind of a nice balance if i could be honest when i look at the trucks right they still do a lot of work on the bodies. They look twisted up. It's it's very aggressive. I never loved that. You know, we'd go to the racetrack around 2003, 2004. I remember pulling out on pit road one time behind Ricky Craven in the 32 tide car. Right. <laughs> and I said to Tony Jr., we was getting ready to go out on the racetrack to practice. I said, damn, I said, damn it, Tony Jr., 
I think Ricky Craven's already backed his car in the damn wall. The left rear quarter panel's pushed all the way over. The right rear quarter panel's hanging out. And he's like, that's the way they're building them these days. I said, well, I hope mine looks like that. We got to go to work, slide that rear tail over and get that quarter panel on the right side flat. And it got, it was cool, but then it got too much. You know, the cars became almost unrecognizable. And when you look at the trucks today, they, you know, they got that big board on the right side and the, and, and the right rear tail pieces slid way over. And I like the car to be symmetrical, you know, and, and even our cup cars just a couple of years ago, you know, had the flat right side. The left rear quarter panel would be bent in toward the center of the car and the car, the tail piece ain't on the car straight. It's moved yeah. over a couple inches. What the hell? Like just. Make them set, set the tailpiece on there centered up. Put the roof on centered up to the roll cage, tailpiece center, nose piece center, and then put the body on it. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where we are with the with the uh, Xfinity cars. You know, we're, our, our bodies are, you know, plastic, and there's areas where NASCAR's like, do not touch this. You touch this, you're in big damn trouble. And we don't touch it. You know, we don't get, we don't get cute. And so I kind of like where the Xfinity series is. It's kind of a good blend between how crazy things used to be in the cup garage 15 years ago and the, and the new kit car that they're racing in the cup series. Now um, the rules and the way the bodies are with the composite bodies, it kind of keeps us pretty honest. I don't have to go crazy with my payroll trying to hire some insanely expensive fabricator you know, you're a good fabricator. You can come in here and hang the body on an Xfinity car pretty easily. And I'll be happy with the job you do. Two, two weeks ago, uh, not exactly on that subject, but we were at Martinsville. Uh, somebody asked Ryan Newman, who was the hardest guy he ever raced on short track? <clears throat> and Ryan Newman said the toughest short track racer he ever raced against was you, Dale Jr., I can remember you getting tired of, you know, what do we call him? Q Q ball ball. headed fool. Yeah. You would move people. You moved Todd Bodine at South Boston getting into three. You moved people in short track racing. Were you surprised that Ryan Newman remembered that about you? I thought he misspoke and he was trying to say dad, but um, so no, I, I thought he meant you. I know. I, I watched that clip, and I was really taken aback that he would mention me out of every driver that he's ever raced. Um, but me and Ryan did have some some hard races, and I mean, Ryan Newman's had a hard race with everybody. He's <laughs> but you know, I um, I me and Ryan had a couple instant incidents on, and they weren't on short tracks; they were in Atlanta back-to-back races so fast we're running the i'm running the top i've got the top figured out this is like 2004 2003 ain't many people got got up to the top of the racetrack yet at that point in time and 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 i'm up there flying and i run and and when you come off the top of turn two at atlanta in 2003 and the guys run the bottom you're going to be about 10 mile an hour faster and Ryan, the way he races, uh, which is fine. We love the way Ryan races. Ryan would come up off the bottom and pull right up in front of you. And you got to stop. And you're going 10 mile an hour faster. And you got this incredible run off the top of the racetrack. And you just got to stop or go to the inside. And I'm like, I don't like that, Ryan. So I ran in the back of him and spun him out. And he wrecked. His motor coach was right next to mine. I thought he was going to whoop my ass when I saw him at the – driver's motor coach a lot after the race but it would come he come up to me and i said man i gotta run off the top why in the hell would you pull in front of me just leave me the outside lane and he said well why don't you go the inside and i said well i'm running the top i want the top and you pulled up in front of my ass i'm going too fast i can't stop and we had this little conversation about it we get back there to the very next race in atlanta and he does the same damn thing i mean it was a carbon copy and I jacked him up and spun him around again. <laughs> and, and so we, you know, I think, and we had some other, you know, good races in our career. And so I think 
those two moments may have imprinted on him that I was aggressive in nature. Um, but I, I felt like I kind of was, I certainly wasn't as, as rough as dad was, but when I, um, I remember racing in my first, uh, Xfinity race at Michigan, I'm running seventh in this, uh, number 31 blue car. I'm only running like five, six races that year. And, uh, just trying to, you know, I'm trying to prove that I belong in there and I'm racing with Dale Jarrett. He's in the number 32 band-aid car, big old Ford. And I, I catch him off of two and I bump him in the left rear and he come over the radio and said, are y'all sure that's junior in that car? Not his daddy <laughs> he just ran over me like his daddy would. And I, you know, when I first started in my career, you know, when you called a guy, you ran into him a little bit, right? You, you, you'd use that headlight and slide. I'm here. Yeah, you use that little right front headlight and kind of slide them on up the racetrack a little bit, just get them up off the bottom and go by them. And, uh, you know, uh, then I started racing in the Cup Series all the time, and Mark Martin, bless him, changed the entire culture on the racetrack. One guy taught the entire field how to race. And, um, you know, when you ran a guy down, you didn't race the crap out of him. You let him go. He's faster. You know, it's, it's halfway in the race. Why do you want to hold him up and slow both of you down? He eventually, he's going to get by you anyways, but you damn hold him up and you cost both of you straight away. Mark Martin taught us that, man, you just let him go. And then later in the race, you run him back down 50 laps or 100 laps later, he, he lets you go. And if you don't, then you then you can hit him, right? Yeah. And so, you know, Mark Mark taught us all how to race, and I cleaned my act up a little bit and um, certainly wasn't quite as rough as I, as I might have been earlier in my career. <clears throat> you just took us through two cultures. <laughs> you know, a, a race a lot, here. I'm. I caught you. You you haven't pulled over, so now I'm gonna knock the hell out of you. And then to to Mark Martin and, and I. You know, Junior. You know, we were racing 500 miles, and you know, I've had that talk given to me before. Hey, boy, Harry Gant. We're not racing each other. We're racing the leader. You know, and we're losing time battling side by side. So. Yeah, I, I like that take. Uh, two different takes, but okay, let's let's lighten the load up here. Let's have a little fun and um, do. I'm not saying a rapid fire, but so I did a show on Monday and I gave you a trophy. Uh, I've, I've given you this. This is the Rick Ric Flair. Woo! Okay, so the reason you get this trophy is this. Okay, how in the hell did you know? that Ryan Blaney was going to win the championship this year. <laughs> you become famous. You called it. So here's your trophy. Uh, I'm giving it through you. I'll send it to you. But yeah. what, what was your deal with – I know you love him, but what did you see early in the year? Well, I'll be honest. I picked Ryan Blaney to win the championship because I think Ryan Blaney as a champion and successful in NASCAR is good for NASCAR. I didn't pick Ryan because I saw something on, you know, in his performance. I just knew that a, a, a Ryan Blaney championship would be positive for us and be, and he's, so <clears throat> there's a, there's a lot here. I will, um, I'll tell you this. So I remember me and Dave Blaney came in together in the Xfinity series. He had this really badass uh, paint scheme, the 93 Amico car. It was, I remember it. He was built. fast. Yeah, he was fast kick-ass little race car and really quiet nice mild-mannered guy he was a father he was a, he a family man I wasn't right so we didn't become friends because we just weren't on the same page but I thought the world of him respected him uh, uh immensely and then I'm standing on the grid at Kansas for uh Ryan's first cup start we had all watched Ryan sort of piece together these little opportunities in the Xfinity series and eventually get a deal with Penske uh, as a developmental driver and get opportunities driving this 22 car. And uh, so we were all a witness to that and, and kind of pulling for him. 
mainly pulling for him because of his daddy, right? You knew who his daddy was, and you're like, I like his daddy, so I'm going to pull for the kid. Yeah. Um, and then you get to know Ryan, and it turns out, man, I mean, he's just salt to the earth. He's just as cool and as easy uh, and as low you know, level as his dad. And so I sat there and talked to him on the start-finish line or on the grid for his first start. We qualified side-by-side. Side. I probably qualified 23rd. And, <laughs> and so Three. hey that's yeah. Michael Jordan <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like hey man you know nobody cares where you finish don't worry about that go out there and run all the laps learn if you wreck early you're not learning I was like nobody expects anything out of you performance wise all right so you don't have to feel like you've got to measure up to a certain thing just go run the laps and have fun this is going to be neat it's going to be surprising and and interesting to you and just make sure you get everything you can out of it and so <clears throat> i see him you know uh i see him renting a house connected to my property i used to own this piece of property and i sold it to brad Kozlowski. well he rents this house from brad to live in it and he's neighbors like earshot from my mother who actually lived down the hill for me so we're all neighbors so him and his buddies, Bubba Wallace, and they're they're all running around on my property on four wheelers and stuff. And These young being, kids <laughs> being goofy, yeah. And uh, and and we became friends. I, you know, after the race, I'd call him up, and he might come over and sit in the basement bar and talk about the race weekend or whatever. And we just got to know each other really well. He wins his first race in the 21 car at Pocono, and I called him and I said, I'm bringing all the beer. Don't you worry about it. He said, my crew's coming over. I said, I'll handle all the beer. Don't worry about it. We'll be there and can't wait for you to get home. And so uh, we ended up, I got a picture that I sent to Dave just the other day. We took on the back porch that night of the whole team, his whole crew and all of us, right? And uh, all his friends, Bubba, and Ricky Stenhouse, and a bunch of other people. And so – Long story short, I've just really always thought a lot of Blaney. The other thing that people may not <clears throat> entirely realize is that everything that anyone has ever asked Ryan to do that would promote the sport, he said yes to. Going out to the West Coast to do sitcoms, mm. any interview. Um, he started his, you know, the Glass Holes podcast. Um, uh, you know, all of those things were just, you know, he didn't make a lot of money. It wasn't like somebody said, here's a briefcase full of money, do this. It was just, Hey man, I I'm getting, you know, I want to promote myself. I want to help promote the sport. He's always really been active, which I admire a lot. I didn't have, I didn't have a whole, I mean, I was doing a lot of things in my young career, uh, to promote the sport, but they weren't my ideas. They were, you know, Budweiser and all these other people were pushing me in this direction. He has more um, foresight, uh, vision uh, to understand how valuable that that work is outside of the race car. And so I've always liked that. And so I thought, man, you know, I want him to win a championship. I want him to be a champion. I want him to be a successful winner. Uh, year in and year out on on our on our on our on our tour, I want that for him personally, but I also want it for our sport because mm -hmm. it would be great for our sport to continue to develop superstars. He's a well-known name in our industry, but I want him to be well-known in the mainstream, and so that's just why I picked him. I said, "Man, I want him to win it. I hope he wins it." And there was part of me that saw a very similar sort of season that Joey had the year before. Joey wasn't lighting the world on fire. When we went to Phoenix and we're interviewing the final four drivers, the championship four at Phoenix, everybody was thinking that Joey wasn't in the mix, right? He wasn't really a threat to win that championship, but when they, you know, when they got done, he, he was the champion and won the race. And I thought to myself, man, if Blaney can get to Phoenix, why can't he win it? He could probably win it. Phoenix is a good track for him. It's great for Penske, but getting there was going to be the hard part. And there were some very, very close calls where he almost didn't get it, get through. But, you know, once he's, once he made it to Phoenix, man, the rest of the industry was like, 
oh, Blaney, he's the favorite. Blaney's the favorite. Look at Martinsville. Look at this. Look at his stats at Phoenix. Blaney's the favorite. And he went out there, had the best car in practice, and then, then the race got the job done. So I made a big stink <clears throat> a, week, a week or two ago. I said that uh, I love NASCAR. It's my life. I want it to do good. But they got to do a better job at getting these drivers' face in the mainstream. We once asked, uh, well, somebody asked Kyle Larson, hey, when you won the championship, what happened? And, and to, I was shocked. He said nothing. He said, I won the championship. Didn't even matter. So about two weeks ago, I did the Kenny Wallace show. This is the Kenny conversation. This is more serious. Uh, I said, NASCAR and everybody's got to start promoting these drivers. And Steve O'Donnell liked that on my Instagram. And I thought, oh boy. So I want to know from you, we have four drivers that finished in the top four. Blaney is 25 years old, all the way up to Larson, 31. Junior, do we have the drivers? And with NASCAR building this new center, you know, there by the Concord Regional Airport, can they get these drivers to where people know them? Do we have the right drivers? Absolutely. Um, we Our drivers are um, great personalities. They're entertaining people. Listen, I mean, Jimmy Johnson is one of the most interesting, coolest guys that I've ever met. I mean, this guy has a, he has a fun sense of humor, likes to goof off, uh, gets wild every once in a while. And he, you know, he was, he was with Lowe's and he was with Hendrick and a lot of things sort of quelled that sort of personality from really ever coming out. He wasn't all that eager to showcase that side of him to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, that person that I knew um, never really became that well known to to the rest of the world. They only knew him as Jimmy, the seven time champion that drives for Hendrick Motorsports, sponsored by Lowe's. And <clears throat> I knew him as these as this really kick ass fun guy that I love to hang out and drink beer with. Falling off the roof of go karts and right. breaking. <laughs> yeah. And so our all our drivers are are fun, badass people. And I feel like that it is somewhat NASCAR's responsibility to take advantage of their avenues and their, their, the things that they're connected to and the access that they have. They, they certainly do work to get the drivers into certain places, right? Outside of our bubble. The, <clears throat> One of the things that I uh, we talked about this on my podcast a little bit a couple, couple weeks ago. One of the things, if we think back to it, Kenny. So if we look at my career, um, I had Budweiser, and Budweiser probably um, had more access and ability to shoot us into the stratosphere more than any other brand, and they did. They took advantage of all of that, sending me to boxing matches, getting me into the Rolling Stone, um, getting me in all of you know, we did. We did all types of articles in publications that weren't asking or calling for NASCAR drivers. Right. Uh, we did MTV Cribs multiple times. Damn, I must have cribs. I did Cribs three or four times. It was awesome. Um you know, we, we were, we did, we, I went to MTV and introduced during the MTV Music Awards, Lincoln Park. Um, that stuff was, you know, it was, was, it wasn't uncommon to see a NASCAR driver to CMT Awards, but at the MTV Music Awards, you weren't seeing NASCAR guys there. That wasn't the power of the Earnhardt last name. That was Bud, man. That was Budweiser. You and wore so, your hat backwards. That was good. So the, the, the corporate sponsors are really the ones that have the most uh, leverage to be able to get a driver into a certain space that they can't get to. And they have the most to gain from it, the most to benefit from it. And so 
we kind of got to we we kind of got to get our partners to really use their leverage to sh- to get these drivers out there and put them in places where um, you know we're not getting access to you know um, the other thing that was different about my time was and I don't want to get in any trouble for saying this maybe I don't but the PR people that a, per, a PR person's job in NASCAR is to secure their driver interviews and speaking opportunities, whether it's in print or video, whatever. They, their job is to get their driver in front of cameras and in front of microphones as often as possible and, is, and, and, and try to make as big a splash on a weekly, daily basis, right? Their job is to promote this driver, get this driver in front of the camera. Well, right now, all of the PR people are usually employed by the race teams. Mm. In 2004, man, or when me and you were racing, the PR people were spon- were hired by the, the sponsor. And so when, when you're a PR person that is employed by Budweiser, there's a lot of pressure. You better perform. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to see you getting, uh, you know, getting an art, getting an article or 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 a piece written in the local paper. That ain't gonna do it. They want to see you on the front page of the USA Today. They want to see you on the front page of the Rolling Stone, or that's a song. Us, yeah, us week, us weekly, whatever. Right? They want that driver to be on uh, the. Um, Cover of the Rolling Stone. Yeah. So it it was um I wonder now, you know, since that shifted, the PR people are now really more employed by the, the race teams, that the motivation and the real true role of the PR person has evolved. Um and maybe there's a you know the, the, the corporate the corporate sponsor didn't want to manage that cost right of that salary for the pr person now the teams had to take it on so the driver had a pr person if they you know if they don't have one they they they're rolling around aimlessly right without really getting any kind of opportunities to be able to be speaking in the media and working in the media and promoting themselves and their sponsors so maybe if we can figure out a way to get that shift back to where these corporate sponsors are investing in people that will help push this driver and get him promoted right I think I love, I love what you're saying. Yeah. So to, to go back to, to your point, like NASCAR's carries some responsibility, but I think they do what they do. They do, they're doing everything they've always done. They're doing, they're doing all they can. I don't see them doing less than what they were doing when I was driving. I think they do a lot. What we're missing, I believe on, on, on the promotion of the drivers is corporate American, how they used to push drivers out into the world. Um, and so, you know, and that that's a I don't know. That's not the whole answer. There's a lot of little things. Right. But you you and I are on the same page. Uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. I'm I'm the bad boy. I believe that we are in a new America. Everybody is scared to death to make a mistake. And therefore, I said, if you don't say nothing, you don't sell nothing. Yeah. It, it, we're, we're boring. And uh, we're both on the same page, except I say it a little more aggressively. Uh, With that being said, this is down my list here. And allow me to say this without any repercussions. Uh, You you are extremely popular. You are one of the most famous athletes in in America. Uh, I've sat there and watched you and Jim France talk, your friends. People admire you. The industry looks up to you. Uh, how do you deal with that? You, I mean, I know that you know that you you hold the key. How do you deal with that? Is it is it a burden or do you like it? I don't feel it. I don't really? Feel, yeah, I don't feel that way. Um, I feel like that um, every day I got to get up and earn uh respect every day i gotta get up and earn my place in the sport and i 
you know, I don't take it for granted. I don't, I don't just assume that I'm going to always um, have a spot at the table, mm. you know? And so <clears throat> I, um, you know, I love broadcasting. I love doing that. I hope to be doing it for a long time. And, um, but I don't, I don't, I don't just assume, man, I'm going to be a broadcaster as long as I want. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, some, I, I have a pretty great relationship with NASCAR. I think sometimes you'd be surprised at, at how, um, <clears throat> how much I get myself into trouble on my own podcast, uh, maybe running my mouth a little bit too much. Um, you know, I get, this happens, this has happened. This is exactly how it goes every single time. Something happens in NASCAR. I get mad about it. I go on my podcast or over to a buddy or whatever, right? And go, that's BS. Why'd they do that? That shouldn't have done that. I, why that? I don't know why they did it that way. That had never done it this way. And then if I take a minute and go talk to Mike Helton or Steve O'Donnell, they'll go, well, let me explain to you why we did it that way. And uh, by the end of the conversation, you're going, oh, man, that makes total sense. Like, I get it. <laughs> and so a lot of times I don't really, uh, you know, a lot of times I get myself in a little bit of trouble. And so that makes me feel like I've always got to be earning back, you know, mm. my space, my place, my role, my job, whatever it is in this whole thing. And I always want to be involved uh, in the sport one way or another. I want to matter. I want to be an asset to it. I want it, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to add to it and raise it up. Um, and But sometimes my actions would say different, right? Sometimes my actions would tell you that I'm pushing back against it and it's a, I, it's something I got to personally work on. You know, you get, I, I truly believe, man, that like my role in life outside of, you know, being a, being a dad and a husband and all those things and running, running junior motorsports. I'm sitting in Kelly's office right now doing this interview. My outside of just the things that you see, my role is to make NASCAR better every day. Absolutely. <clears throat> Now, do I live that way? No, not every day. I get it wrong every once in a while. But that's truly what I want to do. That's where my heart is, right? And uh, but sometimes I get it. I get it wrong. And um, you know, but trying to wake up every day and and wanting to be an asset to something, I don't ever think you wake up feeling like I'm the center of this universe or I'm. You, you don't wake up like understanding your importance. You just wake up every day going, man, I want to matter. I got to do something today to make a difference. I got to do something today that, you know, a Mike Helton or a Steve O'Donnell will go, man, that's, I'm glad he's on our side, you know, or I'm glad he's in this business. He's helped us today, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's hard to move that. It's hard to make that difference. Um, sometimes and sometimes you get it wrong and sometimes you sometimes you uh hopefully get it right i, I find this amazing uh, how humble you are um you know a year ago i commented on why carl edwards left and uh a little birdie told me uh you might have that one was a little rough uh it was it was my take, I didn't mean anything mean by it, but I can, I just want to let you know, I relate. Uh, you know, that, exactly, was, that was on the Kenny Wallace show. It's exactly that kind of thing. You know, you'll, 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 you know, we do these shows, we work to provide content for people and give people entertainment or a unique point of view. And sometimes, you know, you say things without thinking about how it might affect the other person, right. Or the other side. <clears throat> and so sometimes I'll get critical in NASCAR and I think 
Well, they ought to be used to that, right? They ought to be used to people being critical about them. And they, you know, I, I look, you know, it, content is content. It's all good, right? We're all talking about the sport, whether we're talking, whether we really like something that happened or don't like something that happened. But sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes you can take it a little too far. And, Answer that. Let's see who it is. No, nah, it's Kelly's. <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. We got to take it too far. Yeah. Okay, so Dirty Mo. Yeah. I'm I am your biggest fan. Uh this is <clears throat> must watch podcast. Uh I absolutely am addicted to it. Your team does the most fantastic job. They figured it out. The shorts that you put on Twitter or podcast. I have our local dirt racers. They dirt racers who hate NASCAR because they're jealous of it. They listen to you. I listen to you. So what I want to know is I find you sometimes to be a little shy. Uh, where did this Dirty Mo Media, I, I never saw this coming. How did this start? Mike Davis is, uh, yeah, Mike, <laughs> da Mike Davis was my PR guy that Bud had hired to um, to manage, you know, my role as the Budweiser race car driver in the Cup Series. And so, but you know, Mike Davis and I were at the racetrack together <clears throat> every day. <clears throat> and then I hired him to be um, kind of a brand manager for me. I really didn't even know what a brand meant, right? But <clears> – <throat> He, he uh, come on board to sort of manage my brand, which meant basically everything under the umbrella that I had connections to. Um, <clears throat> he was going to manage those partnerships and try to keep building our brand, growing our recognition and, and, and value. <clears throat> and so he came to me one day and he said, man, we need to get into podcasting. And I was like, I've never listened to a podcast in my life. Right. <laughs> I don't plan on it. I don't, I'm right. not going to be a podcaster. I'm not going to listen to podcasts. I listen. You're busy racing, baby. Yeah. I listen to the radio and I listen to music and I watch TV. Yeah. Um, you know, so he's like, trust me, podcasts are going to get popular. You're going to want to be in this space. And he told me how it was going to work. And all I really had to do was record into my phone, just sort of a brief syn synopsis of my race day every Sunday. And then I'd mail it to him. Him and another uh, couple people hosted the show forever, and it grew and grew. You know, it was very popular with our core hardcore fan, right? And it was this great neat piece of content that only they, you know, could get in this one space. And the other thing that I loved about it is, you know, you would you get out of a race car and run your mouth, uh, or or you get to the racetrack on Friday and go in the media center and run your mouth and be all smart assy. Because race car drivers have massive egos, and we're all real smart assy people. <laughs> we know everything. We do. We get in. The, yes. We go in the media center, and we tell. We're, I'm gonna tell y'all what's up. This is what's going on. This is what I think. This is what. This is what's right. And then they write the story, right? And then you read the story, and you go, "Damn, you blew that out of proportion," <laughs> you know. And so the podcast was great because you control the narrative, right? your message is your message and you are in control of it. And whatever you want to put out there, you put in that show, that podcast. And I started, you know, maybe dialing it back a little bit on my interviews outside of the podcast, being a little more reserved. And then when I wanted to say something important that I thought mattered, I'd, I'd go on my show and do it. And then eventually I went to Mike and I said, I think it's time for me to host or co-host. So we've been doing that a while. Um, I never thought it would become what it has become. I never took the interview side of it that seriously until I became a broadcaster. And then I was starting to use the interviews as practice. I'd always been interviewed my whole life. I admired people that gave interviews. Um, Dan Patrick, to me, is probably the best that does it. And then I started asking myself why I thought that and why do I think Dan's so good and what's his technique? And then I started trying to in incorporate it. It's not a mistake that our, that our podcast studio kind of looks similar to the man cave at Dave's place. And so, um, <clears throat> or at Dan's place. So I, um, I've just admired Dan for a long time and, and 
tried to mold my style of interview a bit like his. You, you're never going to be that good, but you, he asked short questions and that enforced that forces the subject to uh, expand, right? If you put all of the answers in your question, you're going to get a real short answer. And so, you know, he just can do so. He can just ask three little, he just say three words of a question in question form and get this really great answer. And so I, I don't know. I, um, I tried to use the podcast and the interview uh, as an opportunity to become a better broadcaster and a better storyteller. And, um, and it's really been fun. We just announced um, that Mike's stepping away. The Dirty Mo Media business has gotten so big and we got so many things we want to do that it's taking more and more of his time and he can't, put what he needs into the Dale Jr. download to be great as a co-host. And he has kind of been wanting to step away for a while now. And then finally we announced that on our final show of this season. So the Dale Jr. download will be somewhat similar to what it is now, but it will be a couple new faces in the room. When you had me on, you were like my therapist. <laughs> you, you, you were absolutely incredible. I was shocked how well prepared you were. You pulled out of me things that I forgot. You went step by step. Um, I just wanted to comment. You are there. You are incredibly good. At well, we got, a, we got a good team around us that helps me with the research, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so well, we all need help. Yeah. So I've got some good help there. And the one thing that I will tell you that I was um, my boss at NBC, Sam Flood, told me, he said, you're curious and just lean into that. Lean into being curious in everything you do. And so when they send me to do the Kentucky Derby, I'm scared to death. Yeah. I'm going to do live TV at the Kentucky Derby. I don't know shit about horse racing. <laughs> I don't. I love it. <laughs> You know, and and so for, you know, for a month, you've got to dive in and become an expert. They don't expect you to get it perfectly right. And so when you don't know something, don't be scared of it. Don't be scared for the audience to find out that you are clueless. Like lean into it and ask questions and be curious, because I'll promise you that more often than not, the viewer at home or the person that's listening is also wanting to ask that same question. You know, and they're all so curious, but they're scared to raise their hand and go, hey, why is they why do they do it this way? You know, Man, how many people don't Probably. raise their hand? No. And so, you know, lean into it uh, that you don't hey, be honest. You don't know everything. And we're going to find out what we don't know. You know, um, I really enjoy doing that kind of work. When I go to the racetrack and I'm working on Sunday, though, I'm supposed to know shit. So I can't lean into my curiosity as much there. But um, when I'm doing the podcast, I'm sitting down with you. I just want to know what your story is. And and so I'm just going to keep digging until I learned all I want to know and heard all I want to hear. So Dirty Mo Media uh, has <laughs> door bumper clear, which is very popular. But I feel like. You deserve another trophy. Somebody at Dirty Mo Media, and this is what I want to know. Who who created Actions Detrimental? Who chose Denny Hamlin? Because it is must listen, it, it, you know, for all the, the right reasons. Yeah. Tell me about Actions Detrimental specifically. That's another Mike Davis idea. I'll be damned. Okay. Yeah. So Mike's the leader of the whole thing. Um, now, I, you know, so I come to Mike a couple years ago and we had, um, there was, there was a player at the Panthers uh, for Carolina Panthers, a football player that we had worked with a little bit. And I was like, Mike, we, we, this guy is pretty sharp. We should probably, um, we ought to do a podcast and he could be the host and we'll have a football podcast. Dirty Mo Media can be more than just racing. Yeah. And so that conversation has sparked, uh, you know, this sort of intention going forward to like grow beyond just my show and door bumper clear. We, 
it's been difficult for us to get outside of our NASCAR world, mm. but Mike wants to have like an SEC college sort of uh, podcast. Um, he's a massive Alabama fan, and we would probably, you know, learn a ton doing something sort of outside of our familiar space of racing. But we have always we've we've had big conversations with Kyle Busch and other drivers uh, about doing a podcast with us here at Dirty Mo Media. I talked to Blaney a couple years ago about his podcast and if he's going to continue to do it, if he would ever move it to Dirty Mo Media. Um, so we've had this interest in having more drivers doing shows in our building. Um, we talked to Denny. I did not think Denny was going to be interested. We went and met with him and his team. We spelled it out in front of him. And it's like, look, man, this is, you know, this is not a lucrative thing. You're not going to walk away, you know, you know, rich off of doing podcasts. That's not what this is about. Um, you do podcasts to control the narrative, share your message, anything in the world that you want to tell people about, you save it for your show and they get it exclusively right there from you. And, you know, you have a race team and all of these assets that you need to be telling people about and that you want people to know about. And this is a great way for you to promote what you're doing and what you're involved in. But it's also a great way for your partners to gain content. And so if you've got a sponsor on, you know, Tyler Reddick's car, well, now you can sell them not only sponsorship on the side of that car and, and on the side of the hauler, but on the podcast, right? This right. action's detrimental, you know, thousands of people tuning in. Exactly. <laughs> you know, there are going to be thousands of people watching this and I can, I can, you know, you can brand my show. We have the Bojangles studio and, you know, Ally and Xfinity and all these brands are now really involved in Dirty Mo Media because they're getting good return. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a business and we all know that Denny is very sharp. And so more than likely, you know, he takes his actions detrimental and maybe creates his own sort of podcast media company one day. But we told him, we're like, start with us. Hmm. We've got, we've got all the listeners ready for you. We'll put you right into our server and, and right in front of all of our fans that we already have. And then you can learn from this experience and, and then take it and do what you want with it. But um, it's been a lot of fun and got in a little bit of trouble early on when he admitted wrecking Chastain. I didn't know if we were done podcasting at that point with Denny Hamlin, but he kept digging. Best thing that ever happened. Well, you know, I was, I'll say this, man, I was surprised in a good way that he stuck to it. He stuck to podcasting and continuing to do his show. And I, I'm curious, he wants to sit down with me down in my studio and go over what that experience has been like for him. Um, you know, podcasting is, a, you, you're very vulnerable. You, you admit to your own flaws and mistakes and you can't be bullshitting people on a podcast. You, you know, you, you know, you know, people are going to see right through that. So when you turn that mic on and that camera, you've got to tell the truth. And that's been an interesting experience for Denny to have to be that vulnerable and that transparent. So I'm eager to sit down with him and uh, sometime in the off season and, and sort of in interview him about that first year experience of his hosting his own show. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I admire what you all are doing. That's why I had to, I agree with you. I just wanted to say my experiences are the same. Ken, Kenny Wallace show is where I run my mouth and I got to gauge when I get in trouble or not. Kenny conversation, <laughs> this one right here is where I shut up and listen. Coffee with Kenny grew on its own. I really appreciate you telling me this because there's no doubt in my mind. I'm, I mean, there's the great Joe Rogan, but buddy, in my mind, you know, I mean, obviously – I don't think you're, you're, you're far behind. Uh, I, I like what you're saying about Mike Davis going as Felix Sabata says, sounds to me like Mike Davis is getting ready to make you worldly. <laughs> uh, sounds like you're going to go into stratosphere and you deserve it. Junior. You're very good at what you do. Uh, all right, let's turn the corner coming down. Th this is kind of, 
this is rapid fire right here. Um, best time in your career, worst time in your career. Best time in my career is probably the 2004 season. We won the Daytona 500 and six races. Um, it was disappointing because we didn't, I didn't know what kind of, I didn't realize that we could have won the championship that year. Mm. You know, no point in that season did I wake up and go, damn, I got a shot at this. And I regret that. I wish I had seen it. Cause I remember my dad telling me, um, and I remember reading in an article or seeing in a, seeing in a video where he says, man, there was a point in that 1980 season where I thought, damn, I might could win the championship this year. You know, he's up there leading, leading the points and it just dawned on him one day. He's like, shit, I could be, a, I could actually win this championship. We might could do this. You know, he thought at some point, you know, the Allison's and the Petties and the Walters were going to just start rattling off finishes and put him in the distance. But that never really occurred to me in 2004. So uh, regretfully, I think that was probably my best shot at a title that never happened. Um, the worst times for me were probably 09 to 2011 or 09 and 2010. Tony Jr. and I had a really good start in 2008. We both moved to Hendrick together. I told, I talked Tony Jr. into making the move. I said, this is going to be great for both of us. We're going to be well taken care of here at Hendrick. Rick loves us both. We got, um, I don't know how far into the 2009 season and uh, things unraveled. The, I, the timeline's a little murky, but we started off great. We went to our first test at Vegas and shocked um, Jeff Gordon about how on how fast we were and how well we worked together and how he, Jeff's like, man, they're going to make us better. This is awesome. We were running really well in the points. Um, we finally won a race. Um, we had great speed and then it just stopped. We just stopped performing. We couldn't get it right. Me and Tony Jr. Me and Tony Jr. would argue on the radio like brothers. And that was normal for us. Um, kind of like a little bit like uh, Truex and, and James and Small, James Small, his crew chief. They, they catch a lot of hell for arguing over the radio, but they get out and they're like, it ain't no big deal. But me and Tony Jr., we were brothers. Yeah, family. family. Yeah, we fought like hell on the radio, and our team was embarrassed. You know, oh, my gosh, you hear what they said to each other? And you did that with the Budweiser car. Oh, yeah. But at Hendrick, it was different. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't think that was great. You know, they didn't think it was n not good. It just was a bad look. But me and Tony Jr. didn't realize that we needed to keep our mouth shut. But anyways, um, they – we all sat down and talked and talked ourselves into making a change. And so Tony Jr. ends up going to Junior Motorsports. And uh, and then I got teamed up um, with uh, McGrew. And, you know, things we just could never really figure it out. I struggled pretty badly during the next couple of years. And, man, I just was – I mean, I was as miserable, down – bottom of the barrel as I could be. It was uh, very, very, very challenging. Thank you for telling me that. So NASCAR today. Sorry, I was supposed to be rapid. No, that was rapid it, fire. That was, no, nothing it, nothing no, about that was rapid. It, it, it is rapid fire. I guess what I mean is, you know, we're coming to the end here. So, no, I love it because everybody wants to know. Because, you know, Everybody feels like Dale Jr. has a charmed life. Everything's perfect. You need, and, and this is a, you know, Jr., sometimes it's okay to make people feel that they're normal. And this whole Kenny conversation, you have done just that. You know, you have made everybody feel normal. And I, and I appreciate that. So you go as long as you want. Uh, so NASCAR today, what do you think about it? I think NASCAR today is um, moving in the right direction. You know, there's some things that I can't explain away that aren't great. Um, you know, our, our TV numbers are question. You know, the TV numbers confuse the hell out of me because I had a I had a I was very entertained in the playoffs. 
I thought that the championship race itself was very entertaining, but I don't know where the numbers are. Um, I don't know why our numbers aren't better, but um, all of the big changes, the next gen car, um, all of the other things that we've done, the racing at the mile and a half is phenomenal. There's um, there was a uh, very big concern over the short track package. Um, we'll call it the short track and road course package because it kind of affects both. But there's already some sort of light at the end of the tunnel with that, which I really wasn't expecting at this point in the year. I thought that the you know any kind of advances or pr- progress made to make the short track racing better was going to be another 12 months down the road. Goodyear had a tire at Martinsville that I think helped us understand a direction to get better. There's a big test in Phoenix that NASCAR and the drivers are fired up about. We had one already at Richmond that did not uh, bear any fruit, but we are going to Phoenix in the winter to continue to work on the short track package. And um, there's some real excitement around what NASCAR wants to try. And for the first time, I think they've said that everything is on the table, even horsepower, if I read the quotes correctly from from O'Donnell. So, yeah. you know, there's uh, there's a lot to be excited about. And I, um, you know, I feel I feel pretty good about it. You know, there was there's some stretches and some moments over the last decade or so that I wasn't so sure about and had big concerns about, but. The, the next gen car has been been better and I'm happier with it personally than I thought I would be and um, yeah I mean I I think the Xfinity series is great there is a big debate internally about what the identity of the Xfinity series will be where is this series five years or ten years from now? Obviously, I care deeply about that because I'm I'm an owner in the series. You know, what does NASCAR? What do the new TV deals look like? Who's in the Who's involved in those TV deals? How will that affect our popularity, and who can see our sport? Um, all of those things are you know have everybody a bit on edge over the next probably 24 months. But once all of that's in the rearview mirror, we can sort of focus back on competition and trying to put on amazing races. Uh, the next gen car, uh, your opinion on the next gen car. What is it? Well, I like it at the mile and a half. It's awesome. I know the drivers complain about dirty air and dirty air has been around since the second race car got built. Um, I, I don't know that you can ever fix it entirely. Sure. It's been worse at times throughout different packages in NASCAR's history, but, when you watch a mile and a half race, um, I mean, look at Charlotte. Let's look at the World 600. Nobody, I mean, the 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 last decade at Charlotte on the Oval, it's been a bit of a hard sale. So much so that we built the Roval and took away one of the Oval dates. Good point. Now, now in Jeff Gluck's, was it a good race poll? The World 600 was second this year. In the last several oval races at Charlotte have been probably some of the most entertaining races of the year. And so the mile and a half stuff's great. I know the drivers don't love the new Atlanta because it's just kind of wild and tough, but I loved that race. I held the show. It was. (laughs) I was, I don't believe I've, I've, that's the most entertained I've been by watching a race in a long damn time. I was blown away by how thrilling all of the action was. And that race ended as in a rain, you know, a uh, rain shortened event. But I still thought to me, that was yeah. the most entertaining handful of laps I'd ever seen. Um, yeah. To, to your there. point, to your point, they're going back at the brickyard. They're, going away from the road course now right to, to your point i want to i do want to say i mentioned it you know the short track package has to get better but nascar goodyear everybody's at the table 
everybody wants to make it better yeah. and they they're going to try their hardest and i think they're going to they're you know they're not going to take the shortcut to try to get there they're going to go through this methodically and try everything to try to get some answers and um, now when they get those answers uh, we may have to be patient before all of the teams can get access to this new uh, parts and pieces, whatever it is that they think they need. But I'm really happy with what I'm seeing in NASCAR in terms of how they're trying to move to figure this out. Cause I want the short tracks to be just as exciting as the mile and a half stuff. And um, that's important to me. Short track racing is our roots it's our history. It's where we came from. It's where all of us learned to race. Yeah. It's a discipline that we absolutely have to have. Last but not least, uh, your opinion on the fines tech inspection, how we're going about governing the sport right now. I'm pretty good with it. Um, I always said that I want NASCAR to be strict and I want penalties to be severe. Mm. You know, right up your alley. Yeah. <laughs> Look, when I get caught or busted or in trouble, man, it sucks. And I, and I don't love, I don't love that experience, yeah. but in my mind, I think that in racing, whether it's a, a cheated up part on a race car or a behavioral issue in the pits or, or a driver behind the wheel with a behavioral issue, you got to nip it in the bud. Let's not, we're not going to tiptoe up onto this. I want a deterrent right then and there that that driver will never want to experience again. Right. And so, you know, I, I think that NASCAR's, you know, made a, you know, they made a stand on messing with this car. They're not going to, you know, it's not going to be fun if you get busted fooling around with these parts. Um, they made that clear. And I'm, I'm, I think that, you know, for the most part, we won't have much to worry about in terms of teams trying to cheat uh, or do something with these these race cars. The behavioral issues is, you know, like the intentional wrecking and so forth. Um, it's a it's a judgment call. It's not as it's not as clear right or wrong. Right. NASCAR has to decide was their intent. Do they want to assume or guess you know they won't they won't black flag a driver for self spinning unless he admits it. Even though you know you're watching that and you're like that dude did that on purpose. Mm-hmm. You know they're not gonna go there and make an assumption unless they've got hard facts and ev- evidence, right? Unless Denny Hamlin admits it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's where it gets tough for me because I'll see something that I know was intentional, and NASCAR sometimes doesn't act without real evidence. And so it gets a little frustrating sometimes, but, you know, other times, you know, they don't always have to have that admission of guilt. Um, but, you know, that, that the, the behavioral issues, sometimes I feel like, you know, certain drivers would have been able to learn quicker what not to do if mm. NASCAR were a little more harsh in some of those decisions there's some times when a driver's wrecked another driver on purpose and nothing got nothing was nothing was done right it was just kind of it looked a little suspect we're not sure if it was on purpose and so they they don't do anything that driver really just gets away with it and thinks that he can do that again next time he wants to yeah well dale jr you are by far the biggest voice uh most respected voice in our sport i want to thank you so much for coming on Kenny Conversation. And remember, everyone, we are in podcast form. You can listen to Dale Jr. on your way to work, on the way back home, iTunes and Spotify. And Dale Jr., I owe you. I got to give you this. You know, I got to give you the Ric Flair trophy for picking Blaney to win the championship. And thank you so much. Well, there's a couple things. Um, I love you to death. I appreciate your friendship. We've been friends for a long time. And I, um, it means the world to me and, um, you're one of my favorite people. I love what you do. I love what you're doing with all of your content that you're creating. Um, you, you know, you, you've 
put yourself out there and it's fun to watch. People care about you. People want to know what you think. Um, and lastly, um, I'm tired of, I'm tired of looking at that race shop that you're in all the time. I, I want to go and be there. I want to come sit down with you and drink some beer. It's been a long time since you and me sat down and had a cold beer in a can. And I, I think every time I see you in that shop shooting one of them videos, I wish I was there. <laughs> well, um, please, please come you're welcome anytime i and know I, think, I am but damn we got to make it happen and stop dragging our feet okay so here's my dream by the way the show's supposed to be over here's <laughs> my here's my dream you you come in we don't really disguise you but you you ride shotgun in my pickup truck and we we run saturday night at i-55 people and then we come back home and it's hot we got the swimming pool the hot tub you know, bring Amy to whatever, and, and we have a good time. I'm doing it. We're going to make it happen this year. We're not going to, we're done fooling around and talking about it. We're going to do it. Kenny Schrader and Ray Mahler will love that. I, <laughs> I love you too, and thank you so much, Junior. All right, buddy.